Okay, let's go ahead and get started. I'm Patrick Byers, Horticulture Field Specialist with University of Missouri Extension, and I want to welcome you to our, our uh, workshop today, Understanding and Managing Weeds. And uh, this workshop is a partnership with Springfield Community Gardens, and I'm so excited to be introducing to you today my moderator, Anna Meadows with Springfield Community Gardens. And Anna, would you like to say a few words? Sure, my name is Anna Meadows. I am the volunteer coordinator for Springfield Community Gardens here in Springfield. Um, our primary mission is to create a community where everyone has access to healthy local food, and that includes our community gardens. Um, we have farm incubators, we have um, programs for beginning farmers, um, just all working together um, to create that mission. And this is a wonderful opportunity to do that. So I'm so happy to be here with Patrick this morning. Thank you, Anna. I'll mention to our attendees that um, we encourage feedback and participation in the workshop today. Uh, you'll have an opportunity to type questions into the chat. And if you're new to the online experience, uh, along the bottom, there is a taskbar and there is a little icon that says chat. And if you click on that, that'll bring up a window where you can type in a question. And Anna will be moderating the chat and uh, she'll let me know uh, if questions come in. And I'll pause periodically during the, uh, the workshop to, to uh, ask for questions as well. Well, let's go ahead and get started. Well, again, I'm Patrick Byers. I'm a horticulture field specialist with the University of Missouri Extension. I'm based in Webster County, uh, just east of Greene County, Springfield. I've worked for uh, University of Missouri Extension for a little over 12 years now. And my work has been primarily with, with farmers, helping them uh, understand sustainability and profitability. And one of the biggest challenges the farmers of all sorts, fruit, vegetable farmers, uh, diversified farmers relate to me is, is understanding and managing weeds. And so that is the topic of our workshop today. Again, I do want to acknowledge the partnership with Springfield Community Gardens. Uh, Springfield Community Gardens, as Anna mentioned, is a, a uh, community-based nonprofit organization that has a vision of a community where everyone has access to healthy local food. Springfield Community Gardens manages a very innovative network of community gardens across Greene County, and they have a very innovative farmer incubator program. Springfield Community Gardens has been successful in uh, securing several grants that include an educational component. And that's where, where uh, my participation comes in to, to offer these workshops. And we'll be having a series of workshops over the next year and encourage you to visit the Springfield Community Gardens website and the Springfield Community Gardens Facebook page for more information on these workshops. These workshops are in partnership with USDA. The uh, USDA is a um, a multi-agency branch of the federal government. They have in, in most counties, a farm services agency office that's abbreviated as the FSA office. And the FSA office is the, the contact point for these different agencies. The Natural Resources Conservation Service abbreviated as NRCS has a number of innovative cost share programs that are available to help foster the development of specialty crop farmers. And so I would encourage uh, anyone to, to uh, reach out to NRCS to learn more about these programs. The Risk Management Agency, or RMA, is another branch of the USDA that, that has programs in place to support specialty crop farmers. And all of these resources are described at the farmers.gov resources website. So reach out to the USDA and learn more about the programs in place to foster specialty crop production. This is the outline of our workshop today. We'll first go through some introductory material related to weeds, and then we'll spend a little bit of time understanding weeds because the first step in managing weeds is to understand them. And then we'll talk about integrated weed management, which is a common sense approach to managing weeds. We'll talk about some of the specific weed management strategies, and then we'll conclude with some basic steps towards ecological weed management. Again, as I mentioned earlier, if there are any questions, please enter them into the chat and Anna will alert me to those and we'll, we'll tackle those questions when they occur. 
So what is a weed? When you get a group of farmers together and, and start talking about production and some of the challenges to production, weeds rise to the top. Well, a broad definition of a weed is a plant out of place. And typically we think of weeds uh, in, in terms of, of non-crop plants, but in some cases, crop plants can actually become weeds. So example in this picture here, corn plants in a soybean field, but mo most generally, these are, are uh, very successful plants that directly compete with our crop plants. Now, why are we concerned about weeds? Well, certainly from an aesthetic standpoint, but more practically from, from the impact of weeds on productivity and profitability. So weeds rob crop plants of light, nutrients, water, and quite frankly, growing space. They will reduce yields. They smother out our desirable crop plants. They can serve as uh, alternate hosts for insects, diseases, and other pests. The combined effect of weed competition is lower crop yields. They also interfere with cultural practices, particularly harvesting, and they can reduce the quality of the harvested product. Uh, weed presence can also contribute to uneven crop maturity. So again, we can see some pretty compelling reasons why we're concerned about weeds. Now, it, it, would this really be an issue if weeds were not hard to control? Well, of course not, but weeds are indeed hard to control. And looking at this picture of Johnson grass, we can see some of the underlying reasons why they're hard to control. Notice that in this picture, you can see a very robust, strong root system. Most weeds have large, efficient root systems that are very, very uh, effective at gathering water and nutrients. They grow rapidly, so they can very quickly fill growing space. They produce tremendous amounts of seed. In some cases, a single weed plant can produce more than a thousand seeds. They can tolerate drought or low fertility, so they will grow even under less than ideal conditions. In many cases, weeds are self-fertile, which means a single weed can blossom and set seed. They may have multiple reproductive strategies. Again, looking back at this picture of Johnson grass, Johnson grass certainly can be dispersed by seed, but it's equally effective at being dispersed by sections of the uh, root system. We can see this uh, very robust root system. Those pieces, if broken off, can start new plants. And quite frankly, the weed is focused on reproduction and it doesn't use any more energy than necessary to produce less foliage, large seeds or fruit. Basically, its goal is to reproduce itself and to reproduce itself in quantity. Now, weed management in horticultural crops is particularly challenging, and that's frequently because we have created special conditions for our crop plants that also provide niches for weed development. And that really is kind of an underlying factor that we'll be talking about for the remainder of our workshop today. Now, let's talk about weeds. Let's try to understand weeds. And weeds can be broken into several different categories by using different criteria. And we'll start by looking at life cycles. We have a group of weeds that are called annual weeds. And these are weeds that complete their life cycle in a single growing season. Now this growing season may include just the summer or may include the fall, winter, and spring, depending upon the type of weed. The, the first group are called summer annuals. Summer annuals generally germinate in the spring and early summer. They then grow, complete their life cycle, produce seed, and then die in the fall. And some examples, these are common weeds, crabgrass, foxtail, pigweed, gallon soga, buttonweed, lamb's quarter. These are all examples of summer annuals. Another group of annual weeds are winter annuals. These weeds germinate in the fall or the early winter. They then grow, make their sp seed in early spring uh, or, or perhaps even as late as early summer, but then they die before the heat of summer comes on. And examples include henbit and chickweed. I should uh, de uh, define a term here at this point, and that's the term germinate. Germinate means that the seeds begin to grow and produce seedlings, which in turn will produce plants that blossom and set seed. But again, the first step is germination, where a seed, a dormant seed, begins to grow and becomes a plant. Another group of weeds are biennials. Uh, biennial weeds have a two season life cycle. Typically they spend their first season as a low growing rosette. And then in the second season, they will send up flowering stems, blossom and set seed. And a good example is a musk thistle as we see here in these pictures. The lower picture is the musk thistle in its first growing season, very low growing, easily escapes mowing, sometimes even escapes notice. But in the second year, it then sends up a shoot that becomes a 
sizable plant that develops a number of flowers which becomes seed. So again, oftentimes we notice musk thistle and, and other biennials in the second year of their growth cycle, but frequently management is more effective when we focus on the first season. And then we have weeds that are more or less perennials, and this means that they will live more than two growth cycles. They frequently reproduce, but they often frequently reproduce by vegetative parts. Uh, some examples include dandelions, tall fescue, Johnson grass, Bermuda grass, and woody perennials. And if we look at these pictures, obviously the top picture is a dandelion and blossom, and soon that flower will become a, 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 a seed head, and then the seed will be blown on the wind to start new dandelion plants. But dandelions can also uh, reproduce by a division of their root systems. Then if we look at the lower picture, here is a particularly pernicious weed called Bermuda grass. And Bermuda grass will, will produce seed and, and propagate that way, but more frequently Bermuda grass is actually uh, spread through vegetative parts. And if we look at the, uh, the uh, lowermost picture there, we can see a situation where a lot of time and energy was spent in digging Bermuda grass rhizomes out of a bed. But any small piece, perhaps even as small as one to two inches left behind in that bed will begin to grow and repopulate the bed with Bermuda grass. So uh, some perennial weeds are particularly difficult to manage because they have multiple reproductive strategies. We can also classify weeds by their plant order. And this is because weeds within different plant orders have common characteristics. And the most common way that they're divided is whether or not they're grassy weeds or broadleaves. Grassy weeds are, as the name implies, grasses. Crabgrass, Bermuda grass, Johnson grass. These are all monocots. Uh, they typically have leaves that have veins that run parallel to each other. And in many cases, the growth point of grassy weeds are at or below the soil surface. And then we have broadleaf weeds. And as the name implies, these weeds have broad leaves. And these include weeds, common weeds, such as dandelion, plantain, pigweed, lamb's quarter. We can see pictures of these here. And again, compare and contrast between a grassy weed and a broadleaf weed. And this is an important classification because there are management strategies that are very effective against broad leaves, but ineffective against grassy weeds. So again, important to understand what type of weed you're, you're uh, working with in a particular setting. Another consideration is that the spectrum of weeds in a horticultural crop tend to mimic the characteristics of that crop. For example, with annual crops, such as ve many vegetables, we typically are dealing with annual weeds. This is because some of the uh, cultural practices in producing an annual crop help reduce the problem of perennial weeds, but don't really reduce the problem of annual weeds. Perennial crops tend to, ha to have problems with perennial weeds. You know, the weed spectrum in an asparagus planting, which is a perennial, will be different than the weed spectrum in an annual vegetable crop planting. Tall crops tend to have tall weeds. Low growing crops tend to have low growing weeds. Woody crops tend to have woody weeds. If we look at that upper picture, that's a picture of an elderberry planting. The plant in front is an elderberry, but the plant just behind it is actually a wild cherry. And again, elderberries and wild cherries share common characteristics. And in an elderberry planting, we tend to have problems with woody weeds like wild cherries, like mulberries, like wild grapes, like wild blackberries and poison ivy. The lower picture shows a strawberry planting. And you'll notice there's a lot of clover growing in amongst the strawberry planting. And, and strawberries and clover actually have very similar growth patterns. And this is one of the reasons that clover becomes a problem in strawberry plantings. Cool season crops tend to have cool season weeds. Warm season crops tend to have warm season weeds. So for example, uh, crops that are grown for fall, winter, and early spring production tend to have problems with cool season weeds such as henbit or chickweed. Whereas warm season crops, uh, such as uh, oh, the solanaceous crops, uh, beans, and, and other warm season crops tend to have problems with warm season weeds, such as gallon soga, pigweed, um, other types of warm season weeds. Now, what really causes weed problems? Well, basically weeds are opportunists. They're looking for niches. They're looking for places to grow and exploit. And the reality of our farming practices, particularly especially crop farms, is that we create niches. And how do we create niches? Well, soil disturbance that uncovers weed seeds. Uh, for example, preparing a, a bed for a seeding a horticultural crop will uncover weed seeds, which will then germinate. 
We also create open uncovered spaces for our crop plants to grow in. And these same open uncovered spaces also provide opportunities for weeds. <clears throat> we provide conditions that favor weed growth. We enhance naturally occurring water through irrigation. We fertilize our crops and we produce situations in which the, uh, there's plenty of light for our crop plants. But again, these two favor weed growth. And then we can also, uh, through our ac actions as farmers, actually introduce problems into a farm setting. We can unwittingly introduce weeds into niches that can then become problems. So again, the reality is we're always going to have weed, weed problems because of the way that we grow crops. So we need to be uh, very conscious of strategies to manage these weed problems. Because again, as I said, weed problems are part of the reality of specialty crop production. Now, where do weed seed or where do weeds come from? Well, first of all, we should introduce the concept of the weed seed bank. And the weed seed bank is the collection of weed seeds that are present in the soil. And again, these, these uh, we'll, we'll talk more about uh, the seed bank here in a moment, but basically we have a starting point with weed seeds at almost every site. We can also have situations where weed seeds can blow in on the wind. You know, many weeds are very effective at spreading because of, of uh, adaptations to favor wind blown movement. You know, for example, the uh, dandelion plant with the, uh, the uh, tuft on it is very easily blown. They can also wash in on surface water. They can be introduced to the farm through the application of soils and organic matter like manures, compost, or mulches. They can come in as a contaminant in crop seed. We can also have dispersion through, through human activity, through uh, birds and other wildlife. But uh, probably the most important place that weeds come from is from other weeds. In other words, weeds allowed to go to seed. If we look at these two pictures here, this is a, uh, a, a pernicious weed called spotted knapweed. Uh, spotted knapweed is found in the Western United States, but it's very quickly spreading across most of the US. This particular weed is very effective at dispersing itself. It produces a seed head, much like a dandelion seed head, where the seeds are easily blown. The seed also adheres to, to, um, to uh, uh, vehicles. Uh, for example, some of the earliest spread of spotted knapweed in Missouri was along railroad right of ways because railroads coming, railroad trains coming from the West frequently had spotted knapweed seeds adhering to the railroad cars. We also find problems with spotted knapweed in hay from Western states where it can come in uh, if the hay is baled at the wrong time, the hay can come in with spotted knapweed seeds present in the, uh, the hay. And then when that hay is fed, these seeds are dispersed throughout pastures here in Missouri. So again, a good example of a, a, a weed species that is very effective at dispersing itself. Now, what causes weed seeds to germinate? You know, if, if weeds are going to be part of our reality, uh, we should be thinking about the conditions that cause them to become a problem. Well, weeds, first of all, have to have the right uh, uh, soil temperatures. And in some cases, they have to have these correct soil temperatures for a period of time before they'll germinate. This is one of the reasons that um, cool season weeds, winter annuals, for example, germinate when the soil is cool and they don't germinate during the warmer part of the season. We also have to have adequate soil moisture to, to encourage the uh, seeds to germinate. There should be good seed to soil contact. This is an interesting situation uh, many farmers have reported that they have more problems with weed germination in areas where there's traffic, either foot traffic or, or equipment traffic. And part of the reason for that is that the compression of the soil actually gives the seeds better soil contact, which encourages them to grow as seedlings. Uh, there are a number of weed seeds that will germinate when they're exposed to light. If these seeds are buried in the soil, they will not germinate. But exposure to light, even a brief flash of light, can start the germination process. Uh, frequently, farmers have mentioned that uh, every time they till, they have another flush of weeds. Well, part of the, the, the situation, part of the reality there is that tillage exposes seeds to light, and then those seeds will begin to germinate. Now, we can use this to our advantage, as we'll see here in, in, in a few minutes when we talk about stale seed bedding. Uh, weed seeds are also uh, more likely to germinate upon exposure to oxygen or nitrate nitrogen. Now, how long are weed seeds viable in the soil? Well, this, of course, is species dependent. Uh, in the case of common lambs quarter, 50 years. Now, it's generally less than that for, for most weeds. And uh, over time, viability does decline. But the reality is that we have uh, a, a, a 
supply of weed seeds in the soil that uh, are, are sufficient for, for a number of years into the future. Again, looking at this upper picture here, this is an example of a soil that has been tilled and we can see very quickly the uh, germination of many, many seedlings in that, that open disturbed soil. Now let's talk about the weed seed bank. So the weed seed bank is again, that deposit of weed seeds in the soil that are just awaiting the proper conditions to germinate and grow. And when we think about managing the weed seed bank, it's all about eliminating deposits. You know, if we want to draw down the balance in the bank, we, we eliminate deposits, that's the first step. Now, how can we do that? Well, the first step is to reduce the annual seed rain from existing weeds. Uh, looking at this picture here, that's a, a foxtail seed head that I'm holding there, and you can see the weed, weed seed falling out of that foxtail seed head. So even just a few weeds, which can produce, as we mentioned before, hundreds or even thousands of seeds, can certainly add more deposits into the weed seed bank. Uh, another uh, way that, that uh, the deposit is increased is by the production of new vegetative reproductive structures. So again, if we allow perennial weeds to grow, Frequently, we'll see the development of additional rhizomes in the case of a weed like um, uh, Johnson grass or Bermuda grass, or we may see the development of other types of reproductive structures. You know, for example, the, uh, the uh, nutlets that form in the soil with nutsedge. We can, uh, uh, typically when we think about supplementing or, or growing the weed seed bank based upon the weeds that are already present at a site, we're looking at seed rain and the production of new reproductive structures. But when we talk about new weeds being introduced into the seed bank, this is a, a, an entirely different matter. And again, sometimes a very serious matter. And in this case, as we talked about earlier, weed seeds can come from lots of places, but they can frequently be brought onto the farm through inputs, or they can be accidentally brought into the farm through wind, movement of water, or the activity of wildlife. Now, how do we make withdrawals from the weed seed bank? Well, there's four basic ways. First of all, germination. Every time a seed germinates, that's a withdrawal from the weed seed bank. And if we can effectively eliminate that germinating seedling, we've eliminated part of the weed seed bank. Fatal germination is another way that we can withdraw. And this is where seeds germinate, but they fail to grow as seedlings. And we can have fatal germination, for example, as the result of allelopathy, which we'll talk about here in a moment. Allelopathy is a situation where plants produce substances in the soil that are fatal to germinating seedlings. Other ways that we can have fatal germination is through the use of um, uh, practices such as occultation, where we, we uh, exclude sunlight from the germinating seedlings. We can also have consumption of weed seeds. Uh, there are a number of beneficial organisms, insects, for example, birds, small mammals, that consume weed seeds, and they can also help with withdrawals from the weed seed bank. And this is particularly helpful if those weed seeds are on the surface of the soil. So we see more of this weed seed consumption in no-till settings. And then again, over time, we'll see a loss of viability or decay. And for example, if we're growing in a no-till setting where we don't turn new weed seeds up, in time, those weed seeds that are buried more deeply in the weed seed bank will die or decay. There was an interesting study in Nebraska uh, where over a five-year period, the researchers worked very hard to reduce broadleaf and grassy weeds in the uh, weed seed bank in this particular study. And so they were, uh, in, in five years, they worked hard at this. They were able to reduce the weed seed bank to 5% of the original density. And again, the, the main strategy was to make sure that weeds were not allowed to produce seeds. In the sixth year, weeds were not controlled and the researchers went back and, and uh, measured and determined that the uh, weed seed bank density had increased to about 90% of the original level. What this means, of course, is that we can't let our guard down. Even one season of neglecting weed management can lead to tremendous deposits into the weed seed bank. So weed management is an ongoing uh, process. It's not something that can be done for a period of time and then uh, let go for, for several years and then come back and expect the weed seed bank to be at manageable levels. Um, do we have any questions at this point, Anna? Yet. Okay, very good. Again, I encourage anyone on the, uh, the workshop to, to please enter questions into the chat and, and we'll certainly tackle them as they come in. So now let's turn our attention to organics. And the uh, focus of my presentation is going to be on uh, non, uh, 
inorganic herbicide weed management. So uh, I'll make a few comments about uh, inorganic herbicides, but most of our discussion is gonna be focused on organic management of weeds. And weed control is a particularly serious issue for organic farmers. And, and here's some of the reality checks. Hand weeding, yes, it's effective, but it's impractical from the standpoint of labor, particularly on organic farms of scale. Organic herbicides are only moderately effective and they're quite costly. So unfortunately, they, they, they are not useful in the broad sense. There are specific situations where they can be very helpful, but in general, they're not a widely used tool. Tillage is a widely used tool in organic production uh, uh, strategies, but unfortunately, repeated tillage damages soil structure. So again, the solution is integrated weed management or IWM. So what is IWM? Well, integrated weed management is an effective and environmentally sensitive approach to weed management that relies on a combination of common sense practices. So in other words, integrated weed management is contrary to, to many of the approaches that conventional farms use. Many conventional farms rely only on one or two strategies, perhaps the use of, of herbicides and tillage, whereas IWM will be using a number of different management strategies. And these are cultural, these are genetic, these are mechanical, these are biological and these are chemical. Let's watch a, a brief video that was uh, developed by uh, NRCS to highlight some of the strategies for uh, weed management on organic farms. And so at this point, I will stop sharing my, my presentation and we'll bring up the video. Anna, can we see the video and hear the sound? <laughs> Excellent, thank you. Any conversation with organic farmers eventually turns to one subject, weeds. A lot of weed seed predation happens. So we keep the weeds high. Having a bunch of weeds. There's more plants, whether they're weeds or not. A single weed can produce more than 10 million seeds. So if they're not dealt with in time, they can present farmers with challenges for years to come. But instead of using chemical herbicides, organic farmers can work with the USDA's Natural Resources Conservation Service to implement a variety of innovative practices that suppress weeds while continuing to build soil health. Cover crops are an effective tool for suppressing weeds, and they can work in three ways. When alive, they effectively outcompete weeds for water, nutrients, and sunlight. As green mulch, they physically prevent the germination of weed seed by preventing access to light and warmer temperatures. Farmers can also use a variety of plastic or paper mulches. These are installed at the beginning of the growing season and come in colors that can directly impact the development of individual crops. Finally, when certain legume, cereal, or brassica cover crops decompose, they produce natural herbicides that can suppress weed seed while sequestering carbon. Using the area between rows to grow additional crops, like growing flowers between rows of berries, is also an effective means to suppress weeds. On open fields, Organic farmers can use minimum tillage practices and a variety of tools for mechanical weeding. Farmers even use devices like flamers. These eradicate weeds before they have time to mature and go to seed. And advances in organic no-till with tools like the roller crimper help organic producers reduce soil disturbances in annual crop rotations. Another valuable tool is a nutrient management plan to help farmers with right source, rate, time, and applications to give crops a growth advantage over weeds. The targeted livestock grazing of cattle, sheep, and goats also offer additional tools for suppressing weed growth. And when all else fails, farmers can and do use the oldest form of weed control 
they weed by hand. To learn more about how NRCS can help organic farmers suppress weeds using cover crops, mulch, nutrient management, no-till farming, and biological weed control, contact your local NRCS office where they can help you help your land organically. Okay, let's go back to the presentation. Okay, Anna, are we back? We are. Okay, very good, thank you. Okay, so that uh, video was a nice introduction to some of the management strategies that organic farmers have at their disposal. We'll be going into details on the uh, strategies that were mentioned. But again, I wanna highlight the uh, programs that <clears throat> NRCS has available to help specialty crop farmers with weed management and encourage you to reach out to your uh, local FSA office and learn more about these programs. Now, when we think about managing weeds, we have to kind of look at the weed life cycle and figure out places where management intervention will be successful. So if we start looking at this diagram here, if we start over on the left, uh, we have dormant weeds that are present in the uh, weed seed bank. And then if uh, conditions are favorable, these seeds will then begin to germinate. And that first step, fatal germination, seed predation, loss of viability, these are ways that we can help manage weeds before they become seedlings. And we talked about several of those approaches already. Then when we're talking about small, uh, the early growth stages of these weeds, seedlings, we have a number of strategies available. These include cultivation, flame weeding, seeding, uh, predation, and disease competition. We also have, uh, as the weeds become larger, we have a number of different uh, approaches that are available. Cultivation and mowing become important at this part. And then if we're dealing with large mature weeds, late cultivation, post-harvest tillage uh, become important too. And then there are a number of management strategies that can be used throughout the, uh, the life cycle. Strategies such as uh, hand pulling and uh, uh, other physical removal of the weed plants. <clears throat> okay, now let's go into some of the strategies and we'll start with land selection. Uh, on every farm, there are troublesome areas. As I talk with farmers, I hear them say, well, you know, bed number six, I always have issues with Queen Anne's lace or, or bed number four, it just got a really serious problem with Bermuda grass. And so if you have a part on the farm that has heavy weed infestations, it may actually be in your interest to not plant crop plants on those sites and to focus on managing the weed issue for several years without having the complication of a crop plant in place. If you do have to plant on these sites where, where there are weed infested fields, plant your most competitive crops. You know, for example, cabbage is a competitive crop against many weeds. It grows quickly, it covers the ground quickly, it, it uh, can actually outcompete many small weeds, whereas lettuce is a very poor competitor against weeds. So cabbage would be a better choice on particular fields that have heavier weed pressure. Uh, keep in mind that it's important to understand the weed spectrum at a given site. You know, for example, a bed that, that has a problem with Queen Anne's lace, which is the same species as carrot, would not be a good choice for planting a ca carrot bed. And in fact, I've had more than one farmer tell me what, what a, uh, a thankless job it is to try to weed carrots that are infested with Queen Anne's lace seedlings because they are very similar. And then again, if you can avoid planting in those areas, consider rehabilitating those fields. Uh, work with uh, several cycles of short-term cover crops, both warm season and cool season cover crops, or consider putting in a perennial cover crop for several years, a crop such as alfalfa, to help draw down the weed seed bank at that particular part of the farm. Plant diversity and cover crops. Uh, again, it's an organic axiom that diverse crop plantings have fewer problems with weeds. And over time, this is certainly the case. 
and incorporating cover crops into a, uh, a, a diverse planting scheme can be very helpful as well. As the video mentioned, cover crops successfully compete for resources, particularly sun, water, and, and uh, nutrients. Cover crops also alter the environmental conditions at a site, frequently making it less favorable for weed uh, production, for weed growth. They can uh, form a physical barrier, particularly if they are left in place as a dense planting, as a, as a green cover crop or green mulch, or if they are terminated, uh, such as through the use of a crimper, and then the uh, debris is allowed to remain on the soil surface. And then some cover crops are actually allelopathic. They release substances either from their root systems or from other parts of the plants as they break down that can cause fatal germination of weed seeds. So again, cover crops can be an important part of weed management. They can remain as a living mulch or they can remain as a residue during a crop rotation. Here is a, a nice example of the use of a cover crop in a cropping cycle. This is annual strawberries and the area between the rows has been planted with annual ryegrass. Annual ryegrass was seeded at a dense rate. It forms a physical barrier to the germination of weed seedlings and annual ryegrass releases substances from its root system. In other words, it's allelopathic, which further helps uh, reduce the uh, germination uh, of, of weed seeds. In other words, it leads to fatal germination. Uh, consider varying the seasonality of planting. Again, understanding the spectrum of weeds at a site. Uh, is your, uh, if you have a site that has a particular issue with uh, winter annuals, um, tillage for a spring crop can actually kill off winter annuals. So think problems such as annual bluegrass, shepherd's purse, uh, chickweed can be managed by a spring tillage before planting a summer annual crop. Uh, tillage for summer crops kills off spring germinating weeds like uh, ragweed. Uh, fall crops allow time for a midsummer fallow to fight purslane. So there are some ways that we can vary the seasonality of planting in response to the weeds that might be present in a particular bed or on a particular part of the farm. We can also vary uh, crops to, to allow varied management practices. You know, for example, there are some types of tillage that are more suited to particular types of crops. And we'll talk more about that here in a moment. But we can time till weed, uh, we can time till uh, corn peas and snap beans, uh, which is a very effective way of managing uh, many annual weeds. Uh, we can cultivate root crops very close to the row. So for example, if we're growing carrots or uh, or uh, uh, beets or another root crop like that, we can actually get quite close to the row because the crop root system is confined to a very narrow area. We can hill up some crops like potatoes and corn to kill in row weeds. We can flame weed corn or we can flame weed corn and alliums. Both of these crops are somewhat resistant to damage from flame weeding, so it works quite well. Garlic grows beautifully through a straw mulch. And then uh, growing short season crops with uh, uh, periods of uh, fallow beds in between can be helpful in controlling uh, weeds, particularly summer weeds, because we never allow for, for weed seed production. We can also use uh, crop seasonality and management practices to keep any particular weed species from getting out of control. So again, short season crops like lettuce and spinach are very effective against short season weeds. Uh, growing a crop like potato, which is easily weeded, and, and is competitive is helpful to, to work with from the standpoint of weed management as well. And then cleaning up after crops like winter squash, this of course is a situation where oftentimes there are escape weeds and this can be a good practice, uh, particularly in managing the uh, weed seed rain from, from uh, summer annual crops. And as I mentioned before, cover crops can be a very important aspect of managing weeds in, in, in a, a uh, on a farm and particularly in troublesome areas on a farm. So again, cool season cover crops after warm season vegetable crops. And then we can terminate the cover crop and use conservation tillage to plant into the killed cover crop. So again, this is a widely adapted, a widely adopted process on, on many organic farms. And then uh, crop competitiveness is another consideration here as well. So again, remembering that uh, crops and weeds compete directly for resources. Now, as farmers, we frequently provide water and nutrients in amounts to, to supply crop needs. And those same uh, inputs are there for weeds as well. But frequently, the uh, two resources that we can work with from the standpoint of crop competitiveness are sunlight and space. So again, if we can develop crops that utilize sunlight and space very effectively and very quickly, 
This will help them exploit those resources better than weeds. Now, unfortunately, reliance on herbicides has, has led to the development of less competitive vegetable cultivars. In other words, these cultivars didn't have to compete because we had the, uh, the production tool of herbicides to control weeds. But in organic settings, this is not the case. Um, this particular situation came home for me personally this year. I tried a dwarf okra cultivar in my garden. And my experience with standard okra cultivars is that they grow quickly, they provide, or they take up growing space very quickly, and they provide shade from the canopy over the soil very quickly. And so I typically don't have serious weed issues in an okra planting. But with dwarf okra, it took much longer before we had plants of any size. The plants were smaller in stature and they didn't do as good a job of covering the soil. So I had to resort to several rounds of tillage to control weeds around the dwarf okra that I typically would not have to do with standard okra. Again, the key with crop competitiveness is early season vigor. Okay, we want a situation where crop plants develop a canopy quickly that takes up sunlight and space before weeds develop. So, you know, granted, if we could select cultivars that are more vigorous, that do a better job of that, that would be the first step. But there are other, other practices that we as farmers can do to tip the scale in favor of, of uh, crop plants. First of all, we can select cultivars for early planting that do well in cool conditions. We can select cultivars that are tall with large canopies. We can select cultivars that are well adapted to our growing site. In other words, an adapted cultivar is gonna take off and grow more quickly than a cultivar that is not as well adapted. We wanna provide optimum growing conditions. Again, recognizing that these are providing optimum conditions for weeds as well, but hopefully we can work with these strategies to develop crops that use these optimum growing conditions. And a very important uh, consideration from the standpoint of crop competitiveness is to use transplants instead of direct seeding. With transplants, you place a plant that is already of size into a growing space and it will more quickly fill that growing space than if you have to rely upon seeding the crop and growing a very small seedling plant to size. And then some other considerations from the standpoint of competitiveness. We can consider reduced row spacing and increased planting density. In other words, we plant more crop plants in a given area of growing space. This maximizes the area occupied by the crop, encourages rapid canopy closure by the crop. And it also, uh, another consideration is that we fill more of the soil volume with crop roots. And again, this, this provides a, an environment that is less favorable for weed development. Now there are some negatives. Uh, crop seed, particularly organic crop seed is expensive and higher density means you need more crop seed. Higher density can also sometimes mean less production per plant and perhaps less uh, or smaller size fruit per plant. The other issue, of course, is that a more dense planting may create a microclimate that favors diseases and insects. Another aspect we can consider is altering the timing of planting to ensure maximum competitiveness. In other words, uh, if we uh, have a system in place where we plant weed, or we, we plant weeds, if we plant crops at the same time that weeds are germinating, oftentimes the weeds will outcompete the crop. On the other hand, if we can give the crop an edge by planting early or late and avoid a time when weeds are germinating, this can be very helpful. Of course, to, to be able to do this effectively, we must understand the spectrum of weeds that are present at a given site. Now, moving into sanitation, uh, very important not to bring problems onto the farm, okay? There are a number of situations that I've worked with over the years where weeds were inadvertently introduced into a farm setting, and then they became a permanent difficult to manage aspect of that farm. You know, for example, if you're blessed with production areas that are not contaminated with Bermuda grass, do everything in your power to avoid introducing Bermuda grass to that site. So some considerations in sanitation, make sure that seed is not contaminated with weed seed. Uh, when you purchase seed from, from reputable seed suppliers, that seed is tested and uh, 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 contaminant seed is, is removed. Prevent weeds from going to seed in the garden. This is probably the most important aspect of sanitation. Make sure that you clean equipment as you bring it onto the farm. Make sure you clean yourself. If you're out hiking in the woods and in, in the prairies and then you come back to your farm, there's a good chance that you're carrying a load of seeds on your trousers, on your socks, on your shoes. Okay, avoid buying topsoil that has weed seeds or perennial plant parts. This is a common way that perennial weeds such as Johnson grass and Bermuda grass are introduced to a farm. 
Make sure the manures have been composted completely. There are a number of weeds that can survive the passage through an animal's digestive tract into the manure. And then if that manure is used to make compost and the compost process is incomplete, those weeds can survive. Do not use mulches that contain weed seed, a very important consideration. Be very cautious, for example, about using spent hay as a mulch because that hay can contain weed seeds. And then do a fall cleanup of weedy material from the garden. Uh, make sure at the end of production cycles that not only do you remove uh, crop residue, but you also remove any weeds that may be present. So again, just uh, to see some examples in photos, uh, proper sanitation practices, as we look at these two pictures of high tunnels, notice that the lower larger picture is a clean site. There are no weeds growing up against the side of the high tunnel. The upper picture shows a high tunnel with the curtain open and weeds growing up against the curtain. There's a good likelihood that weed seed will be blown from the outside into the high tunnel in this sort of a setting. So manage a clean farm. Monitor visitors. Would you let these two gentlemen onto your farm? Well, the answer is hopefully yes, since they're both nationally recognized experts in commercial vegetable production. But notice that they are wearing booties. Notice they have gloves on. They are conscious of the risk of transporting problems onto farms that they visit. And you as a farmer should be similarly conscious of the risk the visitors bring to your farm. You don't have to ask visitors to change their trousers when they come to visit you. But it is important that people arrive on the farm understanding that they can be vectors or transmitters of weed seeds. And then be cautious about equipment. Here is an example of a bed shaper and farmers frequently share bed shapers. But as a bed shaper moves from farm to farm, it should be thoroughly cleaned and all adhering soil should be removed and the, uh, the implement should be washed and sanitized to reduce the possibility of, of weed seeds or weed plant parts being transmitted from farm to farm. This is a good practice from the standpoint of managing insects, diseases, and nematodes as well. Okay, Anna, do we have any questions at this point? No questions yet. Thank you. Now let's start talking about some of the active practices that a farm can have in place to manage weeds. And we'll first talk about tillage and cultivation. So tillage and cultivation is disturbing the soil to eliminate weeds. And for, uh, uh, to start the discussion, it's important to understand what's called the critical weed-free period for crops. You know, tillage is not uniformly uh, helpful at different stages of crop growth, but there are particular stages when crops are, are vulnerable to competition from weeds. And those are the stages when tillage can be incorporated into production cycle to best advantage. And frequently with the weeds, this is early in their life stages. This is as seeds are germinating or as transplants are becoming established and beginning to grow. So again, these are the points where, where cultivation or tillage is most effective. Tillage is most useful with low seed bank densities. In fact, it can be very helpful in further reducing the, uh, the uh, deposits into the uh, seed bank. Uh, tillage cultivation is most useful with small annual weeds. There are a number of weeds that escape tillage, uh, the nightshades, for example, pigweed species, purslanes, and I must emphasize that most perennial weeds are not particularly well managed with tillage or cultivation. And then recognize that tillage can actually spread weed problems. If tillage is delayed into the point where weeds are already producing seeds, the action of tillage can spread those seeds and bury those seeds into the weed seed bank. Tillage can also break up and disperse vegetative propagation parts of weeds such as Johnson grass and, uh, and uh, uh, Bermuda grass. So recognize that tillage is not a universal uh, effective management tool for weeds, but it certainly has its place. There are a number of different types of tillage implements and each tillage implement should be matched with the size of the crop and the type of weed that's being managed. And I'm not gonna go through this entire table. I would encourage you to uh, visit the uh, the uh, publication Weed Management on Organic Farms, which is available through uh, North Carolina State University Cooperative Extension. And the citation is here below. But for example, if we look at a um, flex tine tiller, flex tine tiller is most effective before the crop emerges and when weeds are very small. So in other words, a flex tine tiller would be useful in developing what's called a stale seed bed, which we'll talk about here in, in, in a moment. Uh, using something like a, a modified flex tine tiller can be used with emerged weeds that are 
or with crops that are emerged and weeds of one inches or less. But again, there's different types of, of scenarios where different types of, of equipment is effective. Hi, Patrick, we have a question. Yes, what is that question? It says, I know this talk is focused on weed control in farming settings, but can you make some recommendations for managing weeds along rock or gravel covered walkways? Yes, um, and, and let's go ahead and tackle that uh, right now. So managing weeds along rocks and gravel type walkways is frequently done with either the use of organic herbicides, if it's an annual weed. If it's a perennial weed, you may have to get in there and physically remove the weed. And frequently, uh, rock type uh, paths can be underlain with woven landscape barrier fabric, and that is an effective uh, organic management strategy as well. So before placing the rocks, place the uh, fabric and uh, then place the rocks over the top of it. And we'll talk more about landscape fabric here in, in a, a few minutes. Okay, I wanted to show you some pictures of some of the different types of, um, of tillage equipment. And we'll actually see some videos here in a moment, but the springtime tiller there in the lower right, very effective against small weeds in uh, beds where the crop has not emerged. You can actually remove sections of the springtime tiller and use it in emerged crops as well. The basket weeder, as we see on the lower right, and then the finger weeder, as we see in the upper upper right, I'm sorry, the basket weeder, lower left, finger weeder, upper right, are uh, useful against uh, weeds in uh, emerged crops as well. So let's take a look at a couple of videos that are, are uh, illustrating some of these tillage approaches. Okay, Anna, can we see the uh, video? All the top yeah. plants are uh, okay. pretty large seeded and I can use a Lely weeder on those. Um, and so after I plant, I'll use the Lely weeder before the plant comes up and also after. Um, and a good, good way to judge whether you need the Lely weed is to uh, just run your hands through the soil. And if you see a lot of uh, white thread, um, seeds germinate, it kind of looks like a sprout salad, then you know you're, you're ready to cultivate. When I'm using the machine uh, on crops that haven't emerged yet, I usually uh, dig up a short section of row to see what the crop is doing, how far along it is, whether it's close to, how close it is to coming through the surface, and then I'll know how much uh, pressure I want to put down uh, on the tines. And the way I adjust the tines is by raising and lowering the, the whole machine, the, hard, the lower you push it, the more pressure you're gonna have on the tines. And uh, as I start down the row, I'll, I'll, I'll get them all in the ground and I'll, I'll put it down a little bit. And if I feel like I'm starting to pull some crop up, then I'll raise it a little bit. And, uh, you know, trying to keep it down hard enough that it's still pulling out the, uh, the weeds. Vegetable farmers and their weed control machines. In this video. Okay, well, let's go back to, or let's go ahead and take a look at the uh, second video that I wanted to show. And Okay, Anna, can we see this video as well? We can see it. Okay, very good. Well, here we have the budding basket weeder. And what we do here is we plant all our lettuce is grown from, is transplanted. We do, do, do nothing from seed into the field. It's all transplanted and it's a two row bed system. And a week after transplanting approximately, we'll come in with the budding basket here, which is ground driven off of this chain here. And we'll, we can go approximately, oh, just about as fast as you'd wanna drive it <laughs> on the open field, uh, five miles an hour or so. Uh, it doesn't, its advantage is that it won't throw dirt into the lettuce. It'll just, it moves in this manner and kicks up the weed seeds, cultivating at about one inch depending upon where I set it in the ground. Wait about a week because we get a little bit of germination. 
but we don't want to wait too long because we don't want the weeds to be too big. The advantage of the belly mount is that it does not wander. The, culti the cultivating tool doesn't wander in the field as it would behind the tractor if it was placed behind the tractor. I'm able to view straight down at the, at the uh, a single row. Uh, I can't see both rows, but I can see one row, and I just uh, can see exactly where I'm placing the tool. Absolutely exactly. If I daydream a little bit and it wanders off, I can catch it real quick, whereas when it's behind me, in the case of some of the three-point hitch tools that I use for cultivation, it, it tends to wander a little more, and I tend not to have quite the same control that I would have. I wanted to stress this. I own two of these Kubotas, and this is mounted here all year long. I don't take this off. It's not difficult to mount. It just has four bolts here and four bolts on the other side, but I have it set just perfectly the way I want it, and I honestly believe you should have a tractor for each piece of cultivating equipment you have uh, because the downside on all cultivation is the setup time. What we do is the, the basket is spaced six inches apart, and I'll do two passes here. The first pass, I'll be nursed right up next to the radishes down one side. I'll turn around and come back in the same bed up against the other side as close as I can go. And that way, I get within usually an inch to two inches of the crop, even though I have six inch spacing on the basket. Vegetable farmers and their weed control machines. In this video... Okay, let's go ahead and return to uh, the presentation. Okay, can we see the presentation, Anna? We can. Okay, very good. Okay, um, I, I just, uh, another um, management strategy for the question that came in earlier just occurred to me, and, and that would be the use of flame weeding. Uh, again, if you have a situation where you can safely apply uh, flame to the areas in the rock walkways and along the edges, uh, flame weeding would be very effective against uh, young annual weeds. And if you're persistent, would uh, give some control of perennial weeds as well. Okay, uh, as a, uh, an associated practice with tillage, we have what's called conservation or reduced tillage. And these are situations where we limit disturbance to the soil and we take advantage of uh, residue on the soil surface. Now, of course, this interfaces with mulches, which we'll talk about here in a moment. But in conservation or reduced tillage, we work with a cover crop, we terminate that cover crop, and then we open a narrow area through tillage in which to plant the, uh, the uh, crop plant. And, it's a little hard to see in this picture here, but this was a situation with uh, conservation tillage with squash. And the squash was planted after a crop of annual ryegrass. The annual ryegrass was terminated and laid down with a crimper. And then an area was opened up in the, uh, in the uh, bed and a plastic covered uh, raised bed was, was formed and the squash plants were planted into that. And the area between the uh, beds was maintained with the uh, uh, cover crop residue, and it worked quite well. And again, back to that strawberry picture, here's a nice example of using a living cover crop in between the rows uh, using, uh, again, a, a uh, conservation tillage approach. You know, if you didn't have the cover crop in here, you would have to be regularly tilling the area between the strawberry beds. Another strategy is hand removal. And yes, hand removal is expensive. Yes, hand removal is tedious, but hand removal has its place. This could be hoeing, pulling, cutting. Uh, it's very effective against small annual weeds. It can be useful in managing and targeting escape weeds that, uh, that aren't controlled by other strategies before they produce seed. But you have to be cautious. If we look at these two pictures here, these are both uh, hand pulling of gallon soga. The upper plant where you can see flowers already has seed set. And if you're not cautious about handling this, just the action of pulling that plant up and moving it out of the field can disperse gallon soga seed. It's a much more practical approach to target the gallon soga when it's much smaller as we see in the lower uh, picture there. 
mowing can be a useful way of managing weeds. And the um, area between uh, rows of perennial crops, such as berry crops, we can maintain this in a permanent cover crop that is regularly mowed. We can also mow around the edges of beds and in open areas between beds. Uh, in some cases, we can actually mow over a crop. You know, for example, some low growing crops, uh, mowing can be used to manage the uh, seed production of, of taller growing weeds. Frequently, multiple mowings are needed. Uh, it is important, however, to understand weeds. And this picture here is a picture of foxtail. And foxtail is a particularly troublesome grassy annual weed. And if foxtail is, is a prime consideration in a, in a planting, then uh, you might think, well, I can just go in and mow that several times and that will prevent foxtail from going to seed. But if foxtail is mowed before the seed heads emerge, it will actually generate very low growing seed heads that escape the mowing. It's a more effective practice to wait till the foxtail begins to produce the, uh, the uh, flower heads before they go to seed and mow at that point, because at that point, the plant will not produce additional low lying seed heads. And again, mowing is, is frequently, the, the, the goal of mowing is to control weed seed production. It may not be to eliminate weed plants, but it is a very helpful tool from the standpoint of controlling weed seed production. And then again, recognize though too, that if you mow at the wrong time, you can actually disperse weed seeds just to the activity of mowing. So mowing is helpful, but timing is very important. Flaming. So flaming is, is uh, an, an effective approach against uh, weeds. It's uh, used as a pre-emergent treatment. In other words, a bed may be created uh, where the crop seed is planted and those weeds that germinate before the crop germinates, they can be controlled through weeding. Uh, it can also be used with, with uh, already emerged crops in a selective form in, in a shielded fashion, for example, or around crops that are tolerant to the heat generated by the flame weeder. Flame weeders can be a behind tractor type uh, implements as we see in the upper picture, or they can be handheld backpack type uh, applications as we see in the lower picture. Flame weeding is most effective with small broadleaf weeds. And in fact, in many cases, it's not particularly helpful against grassy weeds. And part of the problem is that uh, grassy weeds, frequently the growth point is at or below the soil surface and it's not effectively destroyed by the flame weeding. Whereas with broadleaf weeds, the growth points are well above the ground and they're destroyed by the flaming process. Flaming is more effective in the afternoon when the weeds are drier and, and less turgid. In other words, there's less moisture in the weed. Uh, let's take a look at a video that illustrates flame weeding. Okay, Anna, can we see the video? We can see it. Okay, excellent. I heard about flame weeding a couple years ago from a fellow farmer and I thought it sounded really intriguing. Um, mainly because I love killing weeds, but also because it does a nice job in some problem areas that we have. Uh, mostly, I use it for stale seed beds and on a certain crops, carrots, beets, slow germinating crops. And the other purpose I'm trying and trying to develop the right tools to build the right tool to do the edges of plastic and the walkways in between rows of plastic, which is a very difficult area to cultivate. You can hoe it and hoe it and hoe it and you just keep doing that all year, all year long. Um, it's, it's working out pretty well, although we have a really good crop of crabgrass and red purslane. It takes a lot of heat to kill it, and the crabgrass especially comes right back. The tall broadleaf weeds are easily killed. Pigweed, uh, lamb's quarters, all of those weeds are easily taken care of, and just to alleviate those weeds for us has been a great help. Uh, although I'd prefer if the crabgrass and the purslane didn't go to seed this year, I'm going to have to do some hand weeding in there, and hopefully in the future I'll put my plastic where there is no crabgrass or purslane. Uh, the two weeders I have are a tractor toolbar mounted one, which is used for the, the wide space in between the plastic, gets the bulk of it, the walkway, and this is quite a bit hotter because I'm running a hundred pound can. As you can see, it's a homemade tool. Um, the other weeder is a backpack mounted one. And my theory on that is to get up close to the edges of the plastic. And it's a fine line between burning plastic and killing weeds. But with proper speed and the proper angle and the proper distance from the ground and the flame adjustment, it's effective. Not on grasses, but on those broadleaf 
we, we talked about. I'm burning only vapor. I've tried to get into the liquid burning. My local propane company got really scared when I talked about that. They tried to help us out a little bit, but they didn't. Once they realized what I was doing and saw this setup, they took their tanks away. And they, uh, so basically, if you're gonna burn liquid, you're on your own. They'd be happy to come fill my vapor tanks anytime and sell me more fuel. But when you talk about liquid, it's, I believe you're on your own because of the liability. Another thing this backpack weeder is really handy for are those little problem areas. It could be where your spacing was wrong on your transplanter or you just, your cultivator sweeps don't quite hit the very center of the walkway. There's an area like that here and uh, you can just walk and kill all those weeds without walking the rototiller or something slower or pulling, pulling them by hand. You can knock them down with this and you can hit basically anywhere in your farm as easily as you can throw in a backpack and take a walk. It doesn't take that long. You got to get the weeds when they're small though, like anything else. My toolbar mount flamer needs quite a bit of work. Um, mainly, it's not hot enough because I'm burning vapor. I'm extracting so much vapor at a time, I get ice up, so my, heat, my flame cools down with time. And that's the big thing I've got to do is go to a bigger tank and maybe use some smaller burners in a gang. Uh, the other big change needed on my toolbar flame weeder is the ground clearance problem. When, once your crop gets big, this has to, the fire has to be so close to the ground, I'm knocking blossoms off of peppers and bending the tomato plants. So I'm gonna put a yoke toolbar and hopefully get a 250 to 300 gallon saddle tank and uh, give it a shot for next year. Okay, well, let's go ahead and um, return to the um, presentation. Okay, so let's talk about some more strategies to, to manage weeds in an active fashion. And I'm seeing more and more farmers using what's called occultation. And occultation is basically excluding, sun, uh, excluding sunlight from, from germinating weeds. And then the weeds, of course, die in that uh, particular type of, a, of an environment. So typically the process is to prepare a bed. And this means, uh, you know, the shallow tillage, turning the weed seeds up, watering the bed, and then covering the bed with the like excluding tarp. And frequently what I hear people using are uh, silage tarps. The uh, weed seeds germinate and then the seedlings die because there is no sunlight to support their growth. And then after a period of time, the bed is uncovered and then the uh, crop is put in with minimal soil disturbance. Another approach that takes a similar type of, a, of a, uh, or results in a similar type of scenario is bed steaming. With uh, bed steaming, uh, a boiler generates steam, which is then distributed down the length of a bed using a, a porous hose or a porous pipe. And then the bed is tarped to retain the heat that comes in with the steam. The goal is a temperature of 160 to 180 degrees in the uh, soil bed. Uh, bed steaming is effective. Uh, it's most effective if the bed soil is moist. The uh, temperature of the steam is most effectively transmitted through the soil if the soil is moist. The bed soil should be uniform and not cloddy. Cloddy areas don't tend to warm up as, as well as uh, more uniform areas uh, warm up. The weed seeds should be near germination and uh, bed steaming is most effective if the, uh, the uh, bed is relatively close to the boiler that's generating the steam. In other words, if there's not a lot of loss of heat in movement of the uh, steam from the, uh, the uh, boiler to the bed. And then of course, the longer the bed, the, the cooler the steam is by the time it reaches the end of the bed. Here we can see, first of all, the uh, boiler that generates the steam. And then in the lower right, we see the uh, insulated line that brings the steam to the bed, the porous hose that releases the steam down the length of the bed and the plastic tarp that is placed over the bed during the process. Typically, farmers report that they get about four, three to four inches of effective weed management through the use of, uh, of uh, uh, bed steaming. Solarization. Solarization has a similar effect to bed steaming, but it takes advantage of the solar energy that, uh, that reaches a field. And in the case of solarization, instead of using a, in case of solarization versus occultation, 
a clear plastic tarp is used. And first of all, again, prepare a seed bed, uh, place the uh, plastic tarp over the, uh, the uh, uh, seed bed. And again, it's most effective if the seed bed is moist. And then the length of time at which to leave the uh, clear tarp in place varies depending upon uh, the research or you know the research reports that I've read or, or farmer's experience, but typically somewhere between two to 10 weeks. After the uh, plastic is removed, minimize soil disturbance so that you don't bring up new weed seeds from below. And uh, if you are going to, uh, to incorporate organic amendments, do all of this before you put down the plastic to solarize. Solarization is most effective in sunny environments, sunny climates, and it's most effective when done during the late spring, summer, and early fall. Another practice is to consider the uh, application of inputs to support crop growth. You know, in other words, fertilization and watering. And if a farmer can come up with a way where those inputs are placed where the crop can use them and that they're not available to weeds, this can be very helpful in weed management. Looking at the upper picture, for example, we see drip irrigation that is irrigating the uh, uh, crop plant, the uh, transplanted spinach plants, but is not watering the area between the rows. This can be very helpful, especially compared to the lower uh, picture, which shows a sprinkler irrigating a sweet corn planting where everything is being watered, both the crop plant and the open areas that could support weed growth. Precise fertilizer banding is helpful. In other words, placing fertilizer just along the crop row and not in the row middles. Uh, fertigation, where fertilizers are applied through the drip line, and again, precisely to the crop can be very helpful. And then subsurface application of nutrients or water can be helpful too. You know, placing lines beneath the crop and then using those lines to, to provide water or uh, soluble fertilizers can be very helpful in providing uh, these inputs for the crop and not for the weeds. Okay, do we have any questions at this point, Anna? No questions right now. Okay, now let's turn our attention to mulching because mulching is one of the most widely used uh, management strategies by organic farmers. Now, why do mulches work? Well, oftentimes we, we think about things such as competition and that sort of thing, but the main reason that mulches work is that they reduce light transmittance. In other words, they keep weed seeds and germinating weed seedlings from exposure to the sunlight. And if we look at this picture here, we see a high tunnel planting of tomatoes where all of the soil has been covered with a mulch. And this farmer has very effectively controlled uh, the transmittance of light to germinating weed seeds. It also, mulches of course give physical impotence. In other words, weeds can't grow through them because of the, uh, the uh, structure of the mulch or the depth of the mulch. And in some cases, mulches actually release chemicals natural herbicides, if you want to look at it that way, that lead to a, a fatal germination. You know, we talked about allelopathy earlier, and that can actually be one of the benefits of using particular types of mulches. So natural mulches. Natural mulches of many types are used in specialty crop production. These can be wood chips, bark, straw, leaves, paper, cardboard, compost, or combinations. Uh, they are uh, best used in small areas or in specialized high value crops. They can be a very expensive way to manage weeds on a large scale. Uh, these should be spread evenly and thickly, at least one and a half to three inches thick. And sometimes, as I mentioned, they're used in combination. So looking at these three pictures, the uppermost picture is a tomato planting that has been mulched with straw. The middle picture is an elderberry planting with a, a uh, wood chip mulch. And the lower picture is a combination of cardboard and wood chips. In this particular situation, the farmer was attempting to, to manage Bermuda grass. And uh, uh, he reported that this approach gave some relief from Bermuda grass problems in the uh, following crop year. We have synthetic single-use mulches. These are typically film mulches. They're made of plastics or of paper. Uh, we have biodegradable types that are acceptable in uh, organic production systems. These types of mulches warm the soil quickly. They're very effective in weed suppression. They help maintain moisture. And in many cases, uh, they can actually produce crops that have higher yields. Uh, there are some negatives. Uh, they're more expensive. Um, they, they, they are expensive. Uh, it limits irrigation options. In other words, you, the farmer is responsible for supplying irrigation, typically through a drip line that is beneath the uh, the uh, single-use mulch. 
They're difficult. It's difficult to apply soil amendments after the planting is in place. The mulches themselves do not provide any soil uh, food to uh, soil biology. And most are not biodegradable. I mentioned there are biodegradable options, but most are not biodegradable. In this picture, we see a, a couple of installations. The first one uh, is a pepper planting. And uh, the, the lower one is, is interesting because we have both uh, synthetic mulch and natural mulch. In this case, a uh, uh, annual strawberry planting planted on a raised bed that is covered with plastic mulch with drip lines through the, through the bed. And then the area between the beds is mulched with straw. And again, nothing works all of the time. Um, there is a weed called yellow nut sedge, which is particularly troublesome for uh, vegetable farmers. In this case, we see a planting of okra, a raised bed covered with a plastic mulch. And the um, uh, yellow nut sedge has leaves that are pointed that actually pierce the mulch and grow through it. And they can be very difficult to control as we see in this picture. And then for, for longer term management using synthetic materials, we have what are called synthetic weed barriers. So most of these are woven fabrics that allow the movement of, um, of air and water through them. Uh, they have some of the same advantages and disadvantages as single use weed barriers. They're durable. Uh, many of them are relate, rated for eight to 10 years of use. They can be used effectively in perennial and annual crops. The upper picture shows a blackberry planting with a synthetic weed barrier. The lower picture shows a lettuce crop that is grown through uh, holes burned in a synthetic weed barrier. And in this case, after the crop uh, is, is harvested, the weed barrier fabric is raised up and then reused. And let's watch a, a video that uh, gives us some information on how to create the holes in a synthetic weed barrier fabric. Okay, can we see the uh, video, Anna? We can see it. Okay. I'm at Bradford, and we are in the hops demonstration project. Today we're planting hops. Uh, first thing that we need to do is to create planting holes in our weed barrier fabric. And the fabric was laid over the raised beds, and now we're going to go ahead and create the holes. All we need to do this is a round a piece of metal like this. A coffee can would suffice. This is something we had on hand here, and a torch. So I'll go ahead and fire up the torch. We already have the planting holes marked, and so I'll place the metal cylinder over the planting hole. And then just take the torch, move it around the inside of the cylinder, and melts the weed barrier fabric and uh, seals the edges where you've, you've melted it so that it doesn't fray. I'll do another one. And we'll do one more. So the end result is a round hole. The edges are, are nicely sealed so it doesn't fray. And we're now ready to plant the hops. Okay, uh, do we have any questions at this point, Anna? No questions right now. Okay, well, let's go back to the uh, presentation. We do have one question. Yes, what is the question? Uh, the question is, is that toxic? Um, I'm, I'm a little bit unsure as far as what, uh, what you're referring to as far as toxic. Um, the uh, weed barrier fabric is considered to be reasonably inert. And in fact, its use is, uh, is approved by a number of organic certification groups. Uh, you know, as you're burning the holes, the fumes could be could be toxic if you breathe them in. But again, you're you're generally producing a very small amount, and it's rapidly dispersed by by air currents. Uh, if if the, there was something else that you were concerned about, please put it into the chat, and we will tackle it. Uh, 
Okay, a relatively new approach to weeding is what's called abrasive weeding. And this is where uh, pieces of equipment are used that can actually uh, propel streams of abrasive grits that will kill, kill weeds. In other words, you have it set up so that the uh, grit is blown into the weeds and the abrasive action will kill the weeds. And different types of materials are used to do this. Uh, granulated walnut shells, for example, finely ground corn cobs, soybean meal, uh, green sand, which is an organically approved uh, fertilizer, can be very effective. Now, uh, it works well if there is a size differential between the weeds and the crops. In other words, if the crops are large and the weeds are small. And it can be used in a, a directed setting where there is a shield to prevent damage to the crop. Broadleaf weeds, uh, this approach works better again because the growth points of broadleaf weeds are well above the soil surface, whereas grassy weeds tend to have growing points that are down in the crown of the plant and abrasives are not nearly as effective. Now let's talk about stale seed bedding. And we've mentioned this several times already. This can be a very effective way of managing seed, uh, weed seed, weed, weed seedlings as they begin to germinate and grow. And so the goal here is to develop a system where the soil that the crop plants are germinating and growing in is as free from weeds as possible. So the bed is first prepared and then the weeds are allowed to germinate. And again, this can be, uh, can be done by encouraging uh, sunlight exposure, it can be done by rainfall or irrigation. In other words, providing uh, environmental conditions that favor germination. And then once the weed seeds are up, then the, uh, the uh, seedlings are eliminated through a light cultivation, through occultation or through flame weeding. Uh, you can actually do this after the crop seed has been planted. Uh, many farmers will prepare the bed initially, uh, remove seedlings at least once, then plant the crop seed into the, uh, the uh, bed, and then possibly get a second round of uh, weed seedling elimination and before the crop seed emerges and grows. So again, it can be very helpful from the standpoint of developing a situation where the crop plants are competitive with the weeds, and especially if uh, the farmer is using transplants. So again, here's an example. This was a bed that was prepared. The seedlings were allowed to grow. The tarp was placed over the bed. The developing seedlings were destroyed through occultation. The tarp was removed, and now it's time to plant a crop into that bed. Now some thoughts on biological control. Uh, there are some cases where we can actually introduce biological controls for weeds. And a good example is uh, musk thistle management with the musk thistle head weevil. This particular weevil can be introduced into areas where there are heavy musk thistle infestations. And the uh, weevil is very effective at eating the seeds out of the heads. And if, if this practice is followed for several years in succession, it can significantly reduce the level of musk thistle infestation. Other uh, approaches, and we talked about this earlier, we can help encourage weed seed mortality by pathogens and seed predators. And some examples of seed predators would be birds, small rodents, and insects. Uh, there are a number of types of bacteria and fungi which will attack and destroy weed seeds. And if weed seeds are left on the soil surface, instead of being incorporated into the soil, many of those seeds will not survive. They will die from desiccation. As far as encouraging weed seed mortality, uh, again, maintaining habitat for predators can be helpful. Uh, reduced tillage is helpful because more seed remains on the soil surface. Uh, diverse ag landscapes can help. Uh, having habitat, for example, for goldfinches, which we see here in this picture, uh, can be helpful. Goldfinches are very effective at foraging for, for weed seeds. Uh, it is, however, a complicated situation. And uh, there's some disagreement on the best ways to, to help encourage weed seed mortality. Animal browsing is another effective biological control for weeds. Uh, the species that has been most utilized are weeder geese. And as we see in the middle picture, uh, Chinese geese are the, uh, the best species and younger geese tend to work better as well. But in many cases, geese actually prefer to forage on weeds versus the crop plant. And for example, they've been widely used in strawberry production systems for many years. Um, Chickens can be used effectively as can sheep, particularly in uh, perennial type crops, uh, things such as berries and trees. It's very important to manage these animals properly to uh, reduce uh, damage to the crop 
And then of course, it's important to recognize that there are produce food safety concerns related to having animals amongst a crop situation, a crop planting. And for example, um, animal browsing uh, uh, or animals should not be present in a cropped area within 120 days of when the crop is going to be harvested from that planting. So for example, with strawberries, uh, wheat or geese would be most effective with, um, with uh, perennial matted rose strawberries after harvest. Allelopathy. Again, a number of, of plants release substances from their roots or from the, uh, the remainder of the plant that actually inhibit the growth of germinating weed seedlings. In other words, they lead to, uh, to a lethal germination. And if we can incorporate these cover crops into a rotation, they can be very helpful. And for example, looking at this table, we can see a number of, uh, of uh, cover crops that do produce allelic chemicals. There's been a lot of research work that is uh, demonstrated, for example, the uh, benefits of using cereal or winter rye, both for the uh, uh, allelopathic substances released from the roots, but also the benefit of allelopathy from killed mulches of this particular crop. There's interest in breeding for allelopathic crops. Uh, granted, this is not nearly as far along as we would like, but uh, there, is some, some, there are some developments there. And then we're looking at the biosynthesis of natural herbicides from plants and microorganisms. So again, some uh, interesting developments underway looking at allelopathy. And then let's turn our attention to organic herbicides. And again, a good resource for uh, farmers interested in learning more about organically approved herbicides is the Organic Materials Review Institute, or OMRI. And a typical label of an organic herbicide will have an OMRI note on it. And if we look at this weed zap label, we can see the OMRI note there in the lower left-hand corner. Now there is only a limited spectrum of organic herbicides. Uh, there's one material, corn gluten meal, that can be used as a pre-emergent organic herbicide. In other words, to target weeds as they germinate and begin to grow. And then there are several organic herbicides that target already growing weeds. And these include acetic acid, citric acid, various aromatic oils, such as D-limonene, clove oil, cinnamon oil, and lemongrass oil, and various garlic formulations. Let's take a closer look at these. So first of all, corn gluten meal. Uh, typically, this is more effective against broadleaf species than it is against corn, uh, grassy weeds. Uh, very effective and used with transplants because corn gluten meal can actually inhibit the uh, germination and emergence of crop plants. So it's typically used in a situation with transplants. Uh, typical rate, 20 pounds per 1,000 square feet. Uh, we can see in this table some of the weeds that respond to corn gluten meal applications. And keep in mind for an organically certified farm that the corn gluten meal must come from non-GMO corn. Looking at post-emergent herbicides, uh, in general, these are, are uh, only effective against uh, annual weeds. They rarely control perennial weeds. They are effective against killed, or they effective against emerged weeds only. In other words, they're not effective in a pre-emergent setting. They work best on young weeds and they work best with broadleaf weeds. To see success with these post-emergent organic herbicides, good coverage is essential. You have to thoroughly cover the, uh, the weed to get good control. And it can be helpful to add an organic adjuvant. An adjuvant is an addition to the, uh, the uh, tank mix that improves the effectiveness of the herbicide. Uh, environmental conditions can impact how well these organic herbicides work, especially temperature and sunlight. They work best in warmer temperatures and in full sun. Keep in mind that they will damage crops as well as weeds and they are expensive. I'm not gonna go into, uh, into a discussion of inorganic herbicides. I will mention the Midwest Vegetable Production Guide for Commercial Growers includes extensive information on herbicides that are labeled for uh, vegetable crops. And a companion guide for fruit growers lists the, uh, the uh, herbicides that are labeled for use on berries, grapes, and uh, tree fruits. Okay, do we have any questions at this point, Anna? No questions right now. Okay. We're going to go into uh, four scenarios now for, for looking at how a farmer might put together a weed management plan for four different crops. And we'll start with arugula. Uh, arugula is typically direct seeded. It's typically uh, uh, planted. It's a short-term crop. It's planted and then it's harvested quickly. So in this case, the farmer uh, developed a stale seed bed by occultating 
a, a bed in preparation for the arugula planting. And then the arugula was seeded into this stale seed bed in close row spacing using a, uh, uh, a uh, seeding machine. And drip irrigation lines were used to irrigate the arugula. And basically the farmer's goal was to have the arugula outrace any competing weeds. And indeed that was the case. And again, arugula, a short-term crop, in this case, the farmer was harvesting twice from the bed. And then by the time the weeds had caught up with the arugula, it was time to terminate the arugula and then develop a rotation into another crop. So this worked quite well for this particular setting. Head lettuce, this was head lettuce in a caterpillar tunnel. In this case, the uh, farmer occultated the tunnel again, or occultated the bed for two weeks and created a, 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 a stale seed bed and then spread a thin layer of clean compost over the bed and then transplanted the lettuce into this bed. And again, the combination of an occultated bed, you know, a stale seed bed, and then a layer of compost mulch was very effective at um, managing weeds around the lettuce until the lettuce crop was grown and harvested. And again, drip irrigation, the placed water and nutrients exactly where the farmer wanted the, uh, the uh, water and nutrients and not in the area between the beds. Blueberry, blueberry is a long-term perennial crop. And in this case, this organic farmer used weed barrier fabric over the row. And we can see the, uh, the blueberry plants were planted on a raised bed and then the weed barrier fabric was placed over the bed, holes were burned and the blueberries were planted through the holes. In this case, the farmer is using two pieces of weed barrier fabric that are pinned together, uh, centered on the row. And this allows the farmer to pull the uh, weed barrier fabric back and add organic amendments at intervals through the life of the planting. Drip irrigation is placed down the row. This is how the uh, plants are, are irrigated and also how they are fertigated. The area between the rows is maintained in a, in a grassy cover crop, perennial cover crop, and it's mowed frequently. And then the area along the edges of the weed barrier fabric are managed with a string trimmer to prevent uh, weeds from, from a developing seed that might blow into the holes that have been burned in the weed barrier fabric. This farmer, again, reported very good success with this approach. Patrick, we have another question. Yes. It says, can a torch like you made holes with be used for small scale flame weeding? Yes, a torch such as I, I uh, uh, showed, uh, which is powered by a, a butane bottle can be very effective in small scale. If you're interested in larger scale weeding though, it's gonna be much more cost effective and practical to use, um, to use a propane bottle and a propane torch. But yes, you know, for example, in that setting that we discussed earlier with the rock paths, a butane torch would be effective. Now, looking at this planting here, we've already discussed this to some degree, but here we have a situation if with annual strawberries in the fall, the beds are created and um, plastic mulch is placed over the beds and a drip line is placed under the plastic mulch and the strawberries are planted through small holes in the plastic mulch. At the same time, the area between the beds is seeded with an annual ryegrass crop and the uh, annual ryegrass grows well in the fall, uh, maintains cover during the winter, and is active in the spring. In the spring, the annual ryegrass provides, uh, is terminated and provides cover for people to walk on during strawberry harvest. And then um, when strawberry harvest is done, the entire planting is then terminated and removed and um, uh, tilled in preparation for a succession planting. Okay, so that brings me to the conclusion of the prepared material. And I just wanted to end with 12 final thoughts from Mark Schoenbeck. And Mark is, is a very innovative organic uh, grower in Virginia. And he has these, these 12 thoughts, which I, which I thought were very, very uh, insightful to, to conclude our workshop. And so Mark's 12 thoughts, first of all, it's important to know the weeds. And again, I think that's clear from our discussion why it's important to understand the weeds because the most effective management strategies come from this understanding. Uh, secondly, do everything that you can to minimize weed niches. If we don't provide places for weeds to, to grow and exploit, then we won't have weed problems. Crop rotation is a critically important aspect of weed management on an organic farm. And make sure that we design cropping systems that, that favor the growth of crop plants at the expense of weeds and make sure that we select tools that do the same thing. Make sure that our weeds are vigorous and competitive. Incorporate cover crops at every opportunity. 
manage the seed bank, do everything we can to draw down the level of the seed bank. Knock out weeds at critical times, both critical times in a crop production cycle, but also critical times in the weed life cycle. Utilize biological processes whenever possible. Get weeds under control with sensitive crops. Some crops will not compete with weeds and they, we must have good weed control in those crops. And then finally, keep observing weeds and adapt as necessary. Recognize that the spectrum of weeds on a farm can change over time. And it's important to be responsive to the realities. And then finally, experiment. There's all kinds of, of new technology available to help in weed management. And there's old technology that we're seeing adapted to today's conditions. So experiment. So with that, that brings me to the end of the workshop. Uh, we have an opportunity now for questions. Um, do we have any questions, Anna, in the uh, chat? Uh, we do not right now. Okay, uh, this would be an opportunity for attendees to also unmute their mics if they would like and ask questions orally. So does anyone have any questions? Okay, well, not hearing any questions. Anna, do we have a, a, a Qualtrics survey? We do. Um, yeah, that'll be a survey that each one of our participants gets in their email after the ending of this workshop. And it'll be just on any feedback that you have for us to improve this experience. If you have any questions or concerns or suggestions, we'd really love to hear it. Uh, we would indeed. And I'll add to it also that uh, the uh, workshops are being funded in part with USDA funds. And the USDA requires us to gather feedback so that they have a clear understanding that we've used these funds well. So we would appreciate your feedback for that reason as well. So when you receive that email, please take just a few moments. I promise it won't take more than five minutes to fill out the survey and give us your feedback. So if we do we have any final questions? Uh, no questions have been written. Okay. Well, I think that we'll conclude the workshop. Thank you everyone for joining us and please stay tuned for uh, future workshops with uh, Springfield Community Gardens. Thank you.